Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As most of you are aware, I attended our annual pastors' conference this past week in Denver. Our pastors' conference consists of men from Colorado and Utah and parts of Wyoming and New Mexico, and we gather together in the fall every year so that we can dig into Scripture, learn more about the, its truths, and grow in faith together. We listen to reports about how things are going throughout our church body, both in this country and around the world. It's always a good time to get together with fellow brothers in the ministry, not only because they are a good group of guys, but because it's, it's nice to learn. It's nice to sit and soak in God's Word and God's truth instead of standing up and teaching it. to admit something. Whenever, whenever I'm at pastor's conference, or any other conference for that matter, I end up comparing myself to everyone else there. Let me give you a couple of examples. We have an opening worship service, and so one of us is designated as the preacher, and the other is designated as the worship leader. We have devotions the next day, one to start off in the morning, one to end the conference. But instead of just sitting back and listening to the Word of God being proclaimed and applied to my life, I find myself silently critiquing and evaluating and criticizing the mannerisms or the style or the content of what I'm hearing. Why would he address the text in that way, I might think? Why would he use that word? Or why would he turn that phrase? Does he understand that he's saying that over and over again? This isn't making any sense. And I wouldn't admit it to anyone but you, but then a, a thought starts to creep up in the back of my mind. papers at your pastor's conference assigned to four of the pastors. And if I'm not one of, the, one of the presenters, I start doing the same thing. Silently critiquing it and evaluating it and even criticizing what I'm hearing. But this paragraph doesn't make any sense. Did they spend any time looking into this topic? I never would have presented it this way. When is he going to get, when is he going to, get to the point I don't even know what he's talking about right now. I wonder if all his Bible classes are this boring. And I wouldn't admit it to anyone but you, but that same thought starts to creep up in the back of my mind. I'm better than he is. And I don't want you to think that our pastor's conferences are filled with jealousy and envy and selfish ambition. They're not. Those thoughts don't dominate my attitude and they don't dominate anyone else's either. We all genuinely want the other guys to do well, not just in their presentations or in their preaching, but especially in their own congregations and in their own ministries. But I would be lying if I said that those thoughts didn't at least rattle around in the dark back alleys of my heart. There's always a subtle comparison going on, a sizing up, a silent appraisal of where I measure up to everyone else because I want to know where I rank. I, I want to know where I fall in line. I want to know if I'm better or not. Does it make you a little uncomfortable that those thoughts are floating around in the back of my head even when I'm not consciously thinking about them? Shouldn't surprise you. That's how sinful human beings operate on a regular basis. It's not just pastors, of course, and not just people in the 21st century. Jesus' own disciples had to deal with this exact same problem. But instead of keeping it to, their self, to themselves and in the back of their own minds, they ended up arguing about it out loud. You heard the story once before in Mark chapter 9. Here's a portion of it again if you want to follow along in your bulletins. 
They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. <coughs> seems kind of silly for the disciples to argue about that, doesn't it? It seems so juvenile and childish for, for Jesus hand-picked dozen apostles to argue with each other about which one of them was the best. But if we look at, at what just happened before this, then it makes a little more sense why a conversation like that might come up. Because just before this, Jesus had singled out Peter, James, and John and took them up onto a mountain and left the other nine disciples behind. And up on that mountain, Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes were radiating light. We call it his transfiguration. And while it was happening, Moses and Elijah suddenly appeared. Prophets who had long been gone now talking with Jesus right in front of Peter, James, and John. And then God the Father speaks from heaven, This is my Son whom I love. Listen to him. And after all this, all this is over, Jesus says to Peter, James, and John, Don't tell anyone about this. Not even the other disciples until I rise from the dead. And so you can almost imagine the scene once they go back down the mountain. And the other nine disciples come up to those three disciples and say, so why did Jesus just take you up on the mountain? What did you hear up there? What did he say to you up there? What did you see up there? And Peter, James, and John would have had to respond, well, we're not really supposed to say. Jesus told us not to tell you, but it was pretty amazing. And then to add insult to injury, when they got back down to the mountain, back down the mountain, and the other nine disciples were there, there's a huge crowd. There's a huge crowd because there's a little boy who was demon possessed, and those nine disciples couldn't cast it out no matter how hard they tried. So Jesus had to step in and do what they couldn't do. Now they were traveling along the road to Capernaum. And a discussion starts. And an argument ensues about which one of them was better. Which one of them was the best? Was Peter better than his brother Andrew just because Peter was in that special three and Andrew was not? Did James and John, fishermen by trade, really have a higher rank than someone like Matthew who had been a prominent tax collector for the federal government? about Philip and Nathaniel? Did Philip automatically have a leg up on Nathaniel because Philip was the one that introduced Nathaniel to Jesus in the first place? Who was more crucial to the cause? Who was more favored by Jesus himself? Who was more talented? Who was more skilled? Who was more beneficial to the ministry at hand? Who was better? Who was best? not tell me that you don't have those same thoughts too. I hope that you don't actually argue about it with other people, but don't you take a look around this room and sometimes give yourself a pat on the back. Well, where's that person today? At least I show up more often than you. She is so tough to talk to, at least I'm pleasant to talk. He is so pessimistic all the time, at least I'm optimistic. 
I think I know my Bible better than they do. I think I'm more likable than they are. I think I volunteer a little more than they do. Those thoughts and many more like them rattle around inside our heads, whether we want to or want them to or not, whether we like to admit them or not. And that's just within our own congregation. Think of the thoughts that you have of people outside of living work. All those silent critiques and evaluations and criticisms of people that you see and hear every single day. These are not like that person. At least don't act like them. <laughs> I'm a lot nicer than they are. I'm a lot smarter than they are. I'm a lot more humble than they are. I'm a lot more Christian they are. Oh, better than they are. It happens, doesn't it? All the time. No wonder the disciples were a little bit embarrassed when Jesus called them out. What were you arguing about as you walked along the road? What were the disciples supposed to say? But notice what Jesus does. Jesus does not lay into them. He sits down and he calls the twelve to them. And then he tells them exactly who was the best. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. As the best is the last. The best is the servant. The best is the one who lowers himself and humbles himself and sacrifices himself for the good of everyone else. And so who was the best out of these 12 disciples? <coughs> None of them were. They were collectively the worst because it didn't matter how they compared to one another. It mattered how they compared to their God. That's what he says to all of us, after all. Be holy, God says it. Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Perfect, sinless, spotless, pure. That's the best. And so have you successfully avoided every single terrible action and attitude, every second, of every minute of your entire life, or have you wallowed in those ways at times? Have you successfully accomplished every single thing you were supposed to do at exactly the time you were supposed to do it? Or have you neglected thousands upon thousands of opportunities and responsibilities and duties throughout your life? Have you been guilt-free from the moment you were born up until today? Or are you overloaded with faults? I don't think we need an answer to those rhetorical questions, do we? Have you been perfect, sinless, spotless, pure? Have you been holy like your God is holy? Are you better than anyone else or are you just as bad? Are you the best or are you more like me, the worst? Of course, that means there is only one person left to be the best. There is only one person left who is perfect, sinless, spotless, pure. Only one person left who put himself in the position of last place, who made himself into the ultimate servant, who did everything he could do to sacrifice himself for the good of everyone else. And that one person, obviously, is Jesus. And if the disciples had been listening to Jesus right before they started their argument, they would have understood it completely. Do you remember what Jesus told them right before they started arguing? I'm going to pause here to let you think. Do you 
remember. You can even say it out loud if you remember. The Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days he will rise. But then what happened? They didn't understand. What are you talking about? But they're too afraid to ask him about it. Jesus was presenting to them the best. The one who would put himself into last place. The one who would make himself the ultimate servant. The one who was going to sacrifice everything for them. They didn't get it. And instead, they started to argue among themselves which one of them was best. Jesus, the Son of God, who created all things and made all things and enjoyed all things, decided to give up all things so that he could be born in a barn to an unwed mother in a backcountry town in the Middle East. Jesus, who was first became the last. Jesus, the Son of God, whom the angels bowed down and served, decided to stoop down himself and become the servant of everyone, helping everyone that he could with everything that they needed, and so he healed people who were sick. And he cast out demons from those who were demon-possessed. He even raised people from the dead. He preached and he taught and he advised without shoving anyone away. He sought out the outcasts and he wrapped his arms around the untouchable and he even got down on his hands and his knees to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus, the master, became the servant. Jesus, the Son of God, who deserves all glory, all praise, and all power, and all majesty decided that he was going to wrap himself in human flesh, skin, bones, and blood. And not just live here, but die here. And let his skin be torn apart. His muscles and his tendons be gouged to the bone. He was going to let his skull be stabbed and his face be pummeled. He was going to permit his enemies to post him to a couple pieces of wood and then bend his head to the ultimate punishment that his father would meet out on all sin of all time. Jesus, the life giver, becomes the sacrifice. So who's the best? Jesus is. And there's not even a second place. Jesus is the best. There's no, there's no one else who could be. Jesus is the best because only He sacrificed Himself for us. Only He serves us in every way. Only He makes Himself in the last place so that we can be the first. Jesus is the best. He always will be. But there's one more thing about Jesus that He does that makes Him even greater than that. Even though Jesus is indisputably the best there ever is, the best there ever was, the best there ever will be. When he looks at you, Jesus thinks that you are the best. Isn't that interesting? When Jesus looks at you, he thinks you are the best. Not because you have done something so extraordinary, but because he has done something so extraordinary to you. He has made you his child through faith in him. He has washed you clean. He has taken away everything that hung against you. And he has forgiven you for everything you ever have done and everything you ever will. He has filled you with his Holy Spirit so overwhelmingly that when he looks at you, he sees someone who is perfect, sinless, spotless, Pure. When he looks at you, he sees someone who's actually holy. When he looks at you, he sees someone who is his own dear child. And so to him, you are the best there is ever 
gente. <coughs> so the disciples had really nothing to worry about on the road to Capernaum in that day. It didn't matter how they compared to one another. In fact, it, it didn't matter at all because they they were terrible. They were selfish. They were woefully inadequate. And yet, at the same time, their Lord had already made them greater than they could ever be <coughs> on their own. <coughs> you don't have to worry about how you compare with anyone else either. I don't have to worry about how I compare to other pastors for that matter. We are all in the same boat. The same boat that Paul was in when he wrote to Timothy that we just sung about a few minutes ago. Chief of Sinners comes from a passage where Paul says, Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. We are the worst, and we know it. And yet, at the same time, Jesus looks at us, and he considers us the best. Who's, who's the best? What's the answer to that question? Well, Jesus is. But because Jesus is, so are we. And there's nothing better than that. Amen. Please stand.